another interesting used item from eBay. And this is uh, from a car scrapping company. And it's a Kia Sportage Ionizer. And on the back it says, Caution high voltage, out voltage DC, three, plus or minus 3.2 kV, do not take off while working. And the information that I found in this is it's not in all models. It's only in the upper class modules, models, should I say, of the vehicle with the extra featured in air conditioning system. And uh, the information I found was the cluster ionizer disinfects and decomposes bad smell from the air conditioner or air inflow. Also, it cleans the air inside the vehicle. When the ignition is switched on, the ionizer runs clean mode and then ion mode. Switching between both modes in the clean mode, the cluster ionizer generates negative ions and positive ions to help clean the smells from the air. In the ion mode, the cluster ionizer generates negative ions and cleans the air inside the vehicle. Now, it's worth noting that there are two electrodes sticking out here with sharp points and a bit mashed from, uh, from th being thrown around a scrapyard. And uh, one of them is six points and the other one is three and other modules I looked at some of them had a very sharp uh, solid metal point and another of them had one of them as a carbon fiber brush interesting so I think the reason they say cluster ionizer is they're cashing in on one of the most famous things in Japan the plasma cluster by sharp it's a very famous air conditioning unit, a module found in air conditioning units that creates both positive and negative ions. You can see the effect of ionization in here. It's all sooty with, uh, with exhaust and pollution schmoo and in the circuit board as well. Uh, I have had to play about the connections. We've got the positive, we've got the negative. There are a couple of wires that I think are data and one that says ion. I'm not really sure. I couldn't get it to do anything. But you know what these things are like? They're they're all tied into the engine management system. And uh, this can send fault codes back to say when it's faulty. So it lights that little expensive light in your dashboard. I think at the moment, I want this metal cover off because we're really not seeing much here. And this is where all the high voltage shenanigans is. So I'm going to flow a bit of solder onto the screening can and hopefully it's not going to suck all the heat away. So I'll put on some juicy lead-based solder, which is better for melting, and it just uh, also refreshes the solder. Uh, if you ever have a problem desoldering something, flow a bit of fresh solder on. It makes a significant difference. And then I'm going to just gently pull down the can at this side while I heat that and see if anything happens. Well, there's movement. Right. Now I'll try the other side. There's movement there as well, but I'm only getting a small amount of movement each time. That's okay, that's good enough. Let's go back to the other side. Anything? No, I might not be getting anything. I shall position my finger so I can drag up this in some way. Strain, strain, strain. I may have to pause while I do this because it's not doing much, is it? Oh, it doesn't want to come off. It's making creaky noises. I tell you what, I shall pause briefly while I do this. One moment, please. Um, well, that doesn't help at all, does it? It's a solid potted block underneath that. Okay, next step, taking this block off. One moment, please. Uh-oh, totally resin potted. That's not helpful. I mean, I can understand why they did it. It's a high-voltage device. right here. now I have to go deeper into this to see if I can work out if it's driven from... I don't see transistors, really, obviously, that could be used to drive this on board here. Uh, I'd normally expect to see push-pull, but having said that, I wonder if it's all the electronics are in here. I shall investigate that. One moment, please. Well, that was a very long one moment, please. And in that time, I've completely reverse engineered it. It's quite interesting. I've also worked out how to hack it and bypass it. So you can just use this without any external car control. And the good news is you don't even need to go inside to do that. You can put a little soda link inside, but you can do it all externally. But in the first instance, I'm going to put a little black backdrop in here. And I'm going to zoom down in this so you can see the ionization in progress. So the ionizer module on the circuit board is covered by the metal screening case, but also another layer of plastic. They're going super mega uh, far with the isolation for good reason. Let me turn the power on. 
So this is it at full cluster mode. So this is the negative one, this is the positive one, and there's a fair voltage. There's a fair voltage between them indeed. That's jumping, I'd say, about a quarter of an inch, six millimeter. Uh, if now, I'll just turn this off while I do this and bridge it out because it does hold a charge. Uh, if I take the ion input, which puts it down into ionizer mode, and I just stuff that into the crop clip and turn it on again, this time the current has dropped from about 100 milliamps down to 71 milliamps. And when I put this in this time, it's much shorter, it's about half the voltage. It's uh, only jumping about eighth of an inch, three millimeters this time. But as soon as you knock that resistor out again, oh, it goes back up to full on 100 milliamp, 107 milliamp. Zappy turbo mode. Lovely. I hope that's not making incredibly loud cracking noises through the microphone it sometimes does. And bridge it and touch it. Yes, it's off. Excellent. So let me show you the circuit board itself. Here is the back of the circuit board. It's very uncluttered. I shall zoom out for this. It would make sense to zoom out. I shall also focus down onto a suitable layer. So the back of the circuit board is, uh, it's not got any components on it. It's purely, it's surface mount circuit board, but with through hole components too. And even the power supplies mount on the other side, but with the electrodes coming through. On the other side though, it gets a lot more complicated. We have the main activation transistor that turns the unit on. We have a voltage regulator that regulates it from 12 to 14 volts down to approximately 7.4 volts. We have the transistor that drives the uh, high voltage transformer. Now, I thought this was going to be a smart module and you'd give, just give it 12 volts and then control signals. No, this is done. It's just two windings. Um, and uh, the output of this, I didn't depot it because depotting this would be quite tricky. Uh, but the output will be a couple of diodes and capacitors, most likely, in the high voltage winding. And it's neat that they've drawn the bobbin in here. You've got the primary, the separator, and then you've got the multiple sections of the um, the actual the high voltage winding. Um, this chip here, I thought was going to be an eight pin microcontroller. It's not. It's a comparator, and its only purpose is to signal back to the unit that uh, that the ionisation is happening. Well, it doesn't even tell you the ionisation is happening. It just tells you that this oscillator is running based around this transistor here. The feedback circuitry is all discrete around that, and even this transistor here, that's the ion transistor that switches mode. Right. Tell you what. Let's go to the schematic. I should mention, by the way that it says in the original data about this that it goes into, when you turn the engine on, it goes into cluster mode. That's presumably based on Sharp's plasma cluster technology. It's got the positive, uh, the smaller positive electrode, it's got the larger negative electrode with the sharp points in it. And uh, it causes molecular chemistry. It breaks the atoms of the, the molecules apart into atoms of the air and then they recombine temporarily in an unstable state that has strong cleansing properties in the air. Uh, it's nature's own way of cleaning stuff. It do does happen naturally outdoors with all these things that it's creating. But when it goes into ion mode, it doesn't specifically just, it implies it turns it into an egg divinizer. It doesn't. It just basically tames the thing down. It reduces its output, but it is still doing that corona thing. Uh, incidentally, I did look through a sensitive camera at it in the dark, and either it's because it's uh, well worn with age, or it's just because it's very low output, which I'd understand. There's very little tiny specks of corona, purple corona discharge in the dark, and that. Uh, Suits the fact it is for a vehicle, it's a tiny space, it's all geared and scaled down just so it doesn't produce too much of the active components, like ozone, in case it causes irritation. So here is the power supply section. The plug itself has uh, two thicker wires, an orange and a black one, positive and negative. It has three smaller wires, the brown ion one that turns it down to the lower level, the CLU, which turns out to be the activation pin, I could zoom in this a little bit further, couldn't I? I could zoom in it a little bit further. So the CLU is the activation. If you want to turn it on remote externally, if you want to bypass the internal controls, if you want to basically emulate, this doesn't interface directly to the car's engine management system, the ECU. Uh, this is obviously an air conditioning module that it goes into, and it is just purely sort of logic level signals. 
So the red one uh, is the CLU, which activates this whole unit. And uh, if you tie it with a 10K resistor to positive, uh, then it will basically turn the unit on at full power. If you want to tame it down, connect the ion to positive. I'd recommend doing it via a resistor, but it turns out on the circuit board there is a resistor. And dig is just a feedback. It's a signal back that it's working. So the incoming supply goes through a polarity protection diode, so it is mechanic proof. And also people connect the battery back to front proof, which is good. It's got a filter capacitor. This fairly chunky ceramic looking capacitor, I think it's a ceramic capacitor. Then it's got a large reservoir capacitor, a inductor for filtering, a small capacitor, ceramic capacitor, and then it's got the main transistor that turns it on. That is a PNP transistor, normally turned off with this 1K resistor on its base going up to the positive rail. Uh, it is pulled down to turn it on by this other little transistor that is connected to CLU. Note there is no resistor to the base of this transistor. You must put a resistor in to limit the current to that. I'm surprised they did that. I thought they could have just, there's plenty of room for it. They could have stuck a little 1K, 10K resistor in there, but they haven't. And there is this uh, little capacitor here for avoiding interference, causing it to glitch on and off at super high speed, whatever. They've, they've included it. I've drawn the transistor this way. I could have drawn it just interrupting the positive rail, but I've drawn it this way because it's going to make it a lot easier for people who are used to the orientation of a PNP transistor. So that then switches power through to the regulator. The regulator is a capacitor either side, and it's a 317MB adjustable regulator, and it's got a potential divider, which just sets the voltage according to a reference voltage that goes in, and that gives out 7.4 volts, and this common zero-volt rail. Excellent. So far, so good. Now, this circuit board, this schematic, should I say, there's schematic, has a bit drawn in green. That's because it's the monitoring circuitry and it was to keep it separate because it is otherwise quite a cluttered design. It was already bad enough without it. Oh, where do I start? So here is the plus 7.4 volts and here is 0 volts. Initially, when you turn the power onto it, current will flow through this resistor and a little pulse through this capacitor and start turning this transistor on when it does current starts flowing through the primary and uh, then it induces current in the feedback which then finds a path back through the capacitor and this resistor and it starts turning that transistor on harder and it can, turns on to the point that uh, it can't couple magnetic field across anymore and then it starts the magnetic field collapses and it effectively does the opposite and it turns itself off so it then starts oscillating backwards and forwards there is a feedback system it's complex as the field collapses depending on what's needed in the secondary the voltage across this feedback winding will be negative with respect to the zero volt rail and it charges this capacitor up negatively. Note how the positive connection of the electrolytic capacitor, 10 microfarad, 50 volt, is connected to the zero volt rail and its negative side is being charged negative to with respect to that rail. These two zeners mean that this uh, feedback path has to go above the voltage of the zener and the negative voltage of that uh, capacitor to be able to start turning this transistor on. So it's a sort of regulation system. And when you uh, take the ion input high, notice there's the 4K7 resistor on it. It turns on this transistor that then puts a lower voltage zener in. So that has to work even harder to actually get above that uh, threshold. So that's how it turns the output down. It just basically affects the oscillation amplitude. There are two 2 ohm resistors here, giving a total 1 ohm, just purely to protect the transistor, I guess. And then we've got the secondary which is referenced, it's got the option on this, it's got a separate pin for the ground, but it is referenced to the zero volt rail, the chassis or chassis, and then it will inside have the diode going from the high voltage winding, the high voltage diode going to the positive side with its own capacitor and the negative side with its own capacitor. They normally have a little resistor and output, but given the cracks and zaps off that, I would say that it doesn't have it. Oh, it's so easy. Describing it compared to how long it took to reverse engineer it, that was a formidable reverse engineering. The feedback circuitry. As this goes positive to show it's oscillating, if it wasn't oscillating, this would be sort of, it would, the field would, here would collapse. It would see a zero volt reference, so it wouldn't charge this capacitor. If it does start oscillating, it charges that capacitor up 
to a voltage level that represents the activity of the feedback. There is a potential divider uh, going to the input of the comparator, which only one side is used. The comparator screwed me up for a long time because I got the pin out wrong. It has a reference voltage going in, which is just a potential divider, based around four resistors, which is quite odd. And then it's got a pull-up resistor in the output, a diode, and then a filter capacitor, and then it goes to the dig pin. And as far as I can see, the dig pin simply tells the actual processor, the main control module, it says that ionizer, you've powered it up and it is running and uh, put an output and here's the confirmation signal that's doing that. If it doesn't get that, it will maybe give it a bit of time, maybe it'll turn it off and on again, don't know. Uh, and then it'll, like the very expensive little engine shaped uh, indicator on your uh, on your dashboard and then you have to take it into the garage and decide what you're going to do. There are probably ways to fake this. There are ways to fake this. You could uh, just put a resistor from the positive to the green dig wire, and that would fool it into thinking everything was just completely funky. I think that would work. I think that's the way they're doing it. Anyway, uh, so the two bypasses that you need for this, if you want to run it, are the one where you basically connect the 10K resistor between the... Uh, the enable wire, the red wire in this instance, and the positive. And if you want to run it at lower output level, uh, then you can add another resistor and wire between the brown wire and the positive as well that, that brings it down to the lower level. There we go. Damn, I wish it was. I wish it had been that fast to reverse engineer it, but it wasn't. It took a long time. So that's quite interesting. These have been around for decades, the, this technology. I think this is a luxury feature that you have to pay more to actually get that feature. I'll brighten the image up a wee tad. Well, it didn't brighten up that much. Uh, but I think this is a luxury option in the air conditioning. And it's very Japanese because they love their uh, plasma cluster units. It's, it's pretty much the same as the Sharp plasma cluster, but every company that makes these has their own version. They're just basically, it's like a ionizer with the extra feature of not just creating that extra medley of chemistry with the positive electrodes as well as the high voltage negative electrodes, but also because they're in the vicinity of each other and there's a sort of ionic short circuit, it does create that extra corona discharge, which uh, enhances that and creates the odor destroying and virus destroying chemicals. But there we go. That is it. The... Ion unit out of whatever the name of that, it was a Kia Sportage. Uh, that's the ionizer unit out of it. That's the bit that keeps the air conditioning sanitary and also keeps your vehicle odor free.